A day after Lynn Konecki was released from the Brooklyn Dodgers, the outfielder was killed in midair by the pilot during a flight to Buffalo. It's a story that would rock social media today, but back then there were more questions than answers. So how did this 31-year-old, who was once called a bright star in the National League, die on his way home from a road trip? We'll tell you that story next. This is Distant Replay. Welcome into Distant Replay. I am Ben George. Glad to have you on the show. Still no Mike Noto, busy with life, but we wanted to get you a true crime episode back. So we found a story that is pretty remarkable, one that I couldn't believe, one that I was surprised that I hadn't heard. There are some stories out there of this, but I don't feel like this is a very well-known story, so we wanted to feature it here on the podcast. Before we get started, please hit subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to the show. We appreciate the support that helps us continue to grow. And uh, the more we grow, the more we can bring you in terms of episodes. So today we have the story of Lynn Konecki, a former Major League Baseball player who was killed mid-flight on his way home from a road trip. We'll tell you the circumstances surrounding that, but let's first take you back and tell you the story of Lynn Konecki up until that fatal day on September 17th, 1935. So Lynn Konecki was born in Barbaroo, Wisconsin, 1904, beginning of the 20th century. His parents moved to Adams County, Wisconsin, when he was nine years old, he, he grew up playing baseball, was a standout baseball player, fell in love with the game, played ball at school. And then while he was in high school, he played second base for the Adams Village team, played there with his brother, Herb, and he grew to love the game. He wanted to play professionally. That was his goal, was to try to play professionally as soon as he could. So shortly after graduating high school, Konecki started chasing his dream of playing professional baseball. So the first stop that he made was with a minor league team in Essanaba, Michigan. Essanaba, if you're not aware, about four hours from his hometown of Adams. It's right there on the peninsula of Michigan, right along a bay, right on the waterfront. Now, minor league baseball doesn't pay very well. If you follow sports at all, you know that, right? There's very little pay even today in minor league baseball. So imagine what a guy that just started playing at the lowest levels of professional baseball was making back in the 1920s. Well, as you can imagine, it wasn't enough to support himself, and a career in the majors was far from a guarantee, even for a player with a lot of promise. So Lynn, away from the baseball field, worked as a fireman. He worked as a fireman on the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. Sure, a noble occupation, right? And one that definitely kept him in shape for baseball. So his career continued on, and he was still had his dreams of playing baseball. And he made his professional debut for the Moline Plowboys, in the Mississippi Valley League in 1927. What a name, too, by the way. Plowboys, the Moline Plowboys, was Konecki's first team. Now, in 1928, he joined the Indianapolis Indians. They were part of the American Association, and he had a, one of his best years, right? He batted an impressive 394 in 1928. So at this point, he's 24 years old. He's starting to gain a reputation as a power hitter, as well as a pretty good outfielder, solid defensive player that can cover a lot of ground. And that reputation was starting to grow. And off the field, too, Lynn's life was going very well. He married a school teacher, Gladys Stuttenberg, in 1930. So life was pretty good at this point. Now, things begin to really take off in 1931 in baseball. This is when Lynn's career really started to peak. He was still playing for the Indianapolis Indians, led the team in runs, batted in, 141 RBI, off 224 hits that season. He was among the top hitters in the league, as you would imagine, and had a 353 batting average to go with it. So a really impressive season in 1931. So even without the technology and without the ability to connect like we have today, word of mouth started spreading, and he was being scouted among the major league teams. So the first team to take a chance on Konecki were the New York Giants. They signed him in December of 1931 in a deal worth $75,000. And just for a little perspective, that 75K would be equivalent to about $1.5 million in 2023. Not too bad, huh? Well, John McGraw was the manager of the Giants at the time, and he predicted that Konecki would be a, quote, bright star in the National League. So as you can tell, life is going very, very good for Konecki. But within the next four years, Konecki would be dead. Let's shift gears to his professional career. Take it year by year, beginning in 1932. Konecki made his Major League debut for the Giants on April 12, 1932, in a game against the Philadelphia Phillies. He played outfield, and it was a hitless debut, so didn't make waves early on, but Konecki would go on to play 42 games for the Giants that season. 
he still had a pretty good reputation as being a solid hitter. He had four home runs that year, drove in 14. His batting average is 255. So, you know, as you would expect, a first-year player in the majors, it took some adjusting to get used to that level. The problem, though, was that his defense struggled that first year. He had five errors for the Giants. So after that short stint and a few struggles at the plate and, of course, the difficulty in the outfield, Konecki returned to the minor leagues. This year, though, in 1932, there was a bit of good news as well as he and his wife welcomed their first child, daughter, and Lucille. So 1933, Konecki was picked up by the Buffalo Bisons of the International League for the 1933 season, and he began to turn things around again. Baseball came back. He started playing as well as he was when he was first being scouted. He hit 334 at the plate, eight home runs, maybe more impressively, 100 RBI for the Buffalo Bisons. So as, as he was starting to play well again in the minors, the majors began paying a little more attention to Konecki. So 1934, the team that decides to bring in the promising outfielder was the Brooklyn Dodgers. Now keep in mind, we'll take you back to that year in 34. This was just three years after Brooklyn had changed its name back to the Dodgers from the Robins, okay? So just to kind of give you a timeline. So that Brooklyn Dodgers team was led by a first-year manager. You might know this name, Casey Stengel. Well, this would turn out to be Konecki's best season. 1934 was a banner year for Konecki. He had 320, 14 home runs, 73 RBI, played center field for the Dodgers, and his defense was up. He only had two errors the entire season, and at that point, that 994 fielding percentage set a National League fielding record. So 1934 was peak Konecki, and things were really good. Now, he was 30 years old, so maybe a little bit later in his career in terms of age, but still, he was at his peak and playing really well heading into 1935. So hopes were high for Konecki and the Dodgers. They even released a publicity book, you know, some kind of a media guy type thing back in the day before that season kicked off, and they featured Konecki in that, for, forecasting some great things to happen for the 31-year-old. Here was a line from that preview. It stated, those magnificent shoulder muscles that are part of Lynn Konecki's physical development were not acquired on the ball field. Rather, he fashioned them during months of back-breaking work as a fireman on the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. There you go. His legend was kind of building there for the Dodgers. But surprisingly, things turned south in remarkably quick fashion. Some of that can be blamed on a shoulder injury he was dealing with, but his average dropped to 283. His power faded, just had four home runs, and his defense even reverted back after that record-setting season. So because his play was starting to suffer, he spent most of his time on the bench that year. So as his play was starting to decline, unfortunately his off-the-field behavior was already on a downward spiral. So reports from that time say he was belligerent and had built a reputation for excessive drinking. He routinely violated curfew. And all this, as you would imagine, caused conflict with his coaching staff. So he didn't really have the support of his staff when you're creating those kind of issues off the field. So everything came to a head on September 15th, 1935. Konecki was out of the lineup once again. They were playing in Chicago. But Stengel called on Konecki to pinch hit in that game in the ninth inning. The at-bat ended in the ground out, went very quietly. And the next day they were in Chicago, Stengel told Konecki that he had been cut from the Dodgers organization. And his contract had been optioned to the Rochester Red Wings of the International League. So you went from a guy in 1934 that hit 320, 14 home runs, 73 RBI, was a star in the National League, a big part, you would think at that time, of the near future of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And now, just a year later, he was off the team and back to the minors. So now here Konecki was in St. Louis just with the news from his manager that he was not a part of the team anymore. And just one day later, he would be dead. So let's take you to that fateful day on September 16th, 1935. So there were a few different details about that day. And kind of the stories, as you would imagine, nearly 90 years later, things have got a little bit jumbled. But here is the gist of what happened that night that led to Konecki's death in midair on an airplane. So after he got the news, he was flying back to the East Coast after being optioned to Rochester. As you can imagine, Konecki's dejected about his future. He's upset about what happened, probably a little bit angry, and he boards an American airline flight that was going to connect through Chicago on its way back to the East Coast. So during that flight, he was drinking a lot of whiskey. I don't know if he was drinking out of the bottle, how it was being served. As you can imagine, the times were different in 1935 on an airplane. I imagine heaters being burned down and ashtrays 
in the armrests. And here's Konecki hitting the whiskey bottle. So as the flight goes on, he's getting more and more drunk. But the problem was it wasn't just drinking. He was harassing passengers as well. He struck a stewardess. And it even got so bad that they reached the point where he had to be restrained and tied down to his seat on the airplane. So at this point, the flight decided we've got to go ahead and land in Detroit, rerouted, go ahead and get him off the plane. Now, he may or may not even have been, been passed out when they escorted him off the plane. Read that in one location. So once they got him off the plane, they took him to a lounge. As you would imagine, wanted him to sober up, had police supervision there, watching over him just to make sure he didn't harass anyone else. So I don't know at this point, too, about what time he gets off this plane. But by 930 that evening, I don't know if this is a matter of a couple hours or if this is a matter of 12 hours. But they had believed, the police, that is, believed that he had sobered up enough that they were fine to let him go on his own. So he only had enough money at that point to get to Buffalo. So he had a charter plane to get him there. And then from there, he would figure it out. The pilot for that charter flight was William Joseph Mulqueeny. He had a friend with him, a fellow pilot, Erwin Davis, who would take Konecki to Buffalo. So they took off around 10 p.m. that night. They were going to follow a course parallel to the north shore of Lake Erie over southern Ontario. And that's when chaos ensued. So Konecki grabbed the pilot by the neck and tried to grab the control of the plane. Now, when you think of a charter flight now, you think of a small plane, you probably think of, you know, the cockpit kind of blocked off, right? A closed door to the cockpit with some seats in the back. But from my images that were drawn in papers back then in 1935, it showed basically two pilot seats in the front and a bench in the back. So you were basically in one cockpit together, small space, pretty confined, with two, two pilots in the front, Konecki sitting in the back row. So he was within arm reach, basically, of the pilot. So as he grabs the neck, tries to take control of the plane, he may or may not have been trying to crash the plane at this point. Don't really know the, the motive because we would never hear from Konecki again. So... Mulqueeny tells Davis, let's get him back to his seat. Let's settle him down. They do that. They move him back. But about 10 minutes later, he's back at it again. He's belligerent again. So Davis attempts to subdue him, hitting him with a fire extinguisher. But Konecki knocks the fire extinguisher out of his hand. Now, one report said this lasted like two hours. That time frame seems incredible that they could have been fighting in the midair for uh, over an hour. But either way, things were dangerously still out of control as they were still trying to get Konecki down. And imagine, this is a guy that was a fire fireman working on the railroad when he wasn't playing baseball. So you got to imagine a very blue-collar, tough, physical human being, professional athlete. So two guys trying to corral him in midair while trying to keep a flight in the air in 1935. You can imagine there were probably some difficulties. So here's what one newspaper documented, how it all unfolded. So Davis yelled for help. This is the pilot speaking. I looked back and saw Konecki was fighting Davis. He then tried to get at me. Davis hit at Konecki with the fire extinguisher, knocked it out of his hand, and he again came for me, the pilot said. So holding the controls in one hand, I picked up the extinguisher and I hit at Konecki, but I hit Davis. And then I hit Konecki two or three times with the extinguisher, but he kept on fighting, so I hit him again. So you got to imagine, he's, already, he's fighting, fighting, fighting. The pilot says he hits him multiple times, finally one last time to subdue him in the middle of the air. They were able to finally calm this crazed Konecki down by hitting him with that blunt end of a fire extinguisher. So he's out cold now on the plane. Mulqueeny's got control of it once again. But at this point, he doesn't know how far off course he is. So he's kind of circling in the air a little bit, looking for a place to put the plane down. He doesn't have a whole lot of guidance, right? There's not a whole lot of light, as you can imagine, in 1935 in the middle of the night in southern Ontario. So he's got the moonlight to basically light the way for him. He said he circled two or three times and eventually landed down in the infield of Long Branch Racetrack, which is pretty close to Toronto. Some people were there at the track, police included, when he got off the plane. McQueenie and Davis both ex exited the plane. Authorities go inside the plane. As you can imagine, I don't know what this could look like, right? You, you've had fighting for potentially two hours in midair, but there was... Reports of a blood-splattered cabin and Konecki's facial features barely discernible. By the description, you can tell they just went at him over and over again. So Konecki was slumped in his seat, wasn't showing any signs of life. And then Mulqueeny and Davis were bloodied, bruised, and had bite marks on them as well. When they landed, they weren't even sure where they are, asking where they were to people that surrounded them when they got off the plane. Davis and Mulqueeny at that point were charged with manslaughter held for a time in Toronto as Canadian officials 
investigated the incident. The autopsy concluded that Konecki died before the plane touched down. The cause of death, cerebral hemorrhage. Now, this is the first time, too, that an incident like this happened in North American commercial aviation history. And because the airplane was registered in the U.S., the assault took place in Canadian airspace, there was no precedent for how to handle this for authorities. So the aircraft just remained at the racetrack under the guard of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Now, of course, the Dodger teammates couldn't believe the news when they heard it. New York Times reported that Konecki's teammates were crying the next day when they got the news of his death. Remember, he was on their team just two days ago. Casey Stengel, unable to speak, could not believe the news when he first heard it, even asked, how does Konecki end up in a plane above Toronto when that it wasn't even his course home when we sent him home a day prior? In honor of the deceased teammates, the Dodgers wore black armbands at their next home game. And sadly, his wife Gladys and his daughter Anne were living in Brooklyn for that summer, and they would not speak to the press upon hearing that news. They were headed back to Adams, Wisconsin, as soon as possible. Well, after the investigation, they held a trial. Plenty of eyes were on this. Interest was immense, both in the U.S. and Canada. The Attorney General of Ontario represented the Crown at the trial. And as you can imagine, the evidence clearly laid out that it was a self-defense case for the pilot and his assistant. The two Americans were found not guilty and released. Well, Konecki's funeral was held just a few days later, Saturday, September 21st, at a Lutheran church in Adams. His remains brought from, by train from Toronto and arrived in Adams on Thursday afternoon. More than 250 mourners attended, and by some accounts, many people were standing outside of the church because there was no more room inside. Konecki is now buried in Mount Repose Cemetery in friendship. His widow, Gladys, never remarried. She passed away in 1978. She's buried at the same cemetery. And their daughter, Anne Lucille, who reportedly inherited her father's athletic abilities. She was said to have been a great pitcher when she played softball, but unfortunately passed away in February of 2014 after a battle with breast cancer, leaving behind her husband of 61 years and her two children. It's a remarkable story and one that you might not have heard yet, but one that would have been headline news had it happened today. That is the story of Lynn Konecki, the former Brooklyn Dodgers outfielder, here on Distant Replay. Please subscribe to the show if you enjoyed what you heard today. We'll have more to come. and We'd love to hear your comments on who you'd like to hear from, what true crime stories you'd like us to cover, and any games you'd like us to go back and watch as well. I am Ben George. Thanks for listening. Take care.